Um, so the tradition that this physicalness, this physical image comes from, is also animistic shamanism. It, it can be found, the kind of, the hair roots, you might say, this Taoist idea of physiology are in animistic shamanism, which is still surviving and now having a renaissance in Central Asia. Now the Russians backed off. Um, and this notion of you know singing someone back into health or dancing or something. <laughs> Those are actually the hair roots. Those are the roots without really specific concepts. Um, just the idea that there can be some non-cognitive and non-manipulative, non-chemical kind of recalibration of someone's energy. Um, the, the methods might be giggled at by Taoists, but uh, most of the temples in China that are called Taoists were, in fact, animistic temples that Taoists were assigned to watch the mediums to make sure they don't get too weird, and particularly to watch the mediums so that they don't create war, skirmishing of tribes. Because uh, Han culture and Chinese civilization used Taoism as the state religion, and how it did that was assign Taoists into the temples of all the clans and tribes, and not allow them the religious fervor of going to war which was common for the six, seven thousand years before. So no human sacrifice, which is what war was, number one. Number two is the no animal sacrifice eventually. So if you go to Chinatown, you will find incense. The yellow incense with the red stick. It's a chicken upside down being bled out. <laughs> the Taoists came up with ways in which the old imagery of bleeding your offerings to death um, and then burning them was made into incense. So this took, uh, you know, this is Taoism's real work in Chinese civilization was that sort of bringing up nationalism on a, um, and creating a religion that nobody could say no to. Our tribe worships this mountain, and they go, hmm, looks like a male mountain to us. Go, yes, it is a male mountain. <laughs> this is how you take over. Well, there's two kinds of mountains, a male mountain and female mountain. That's called yin and yang. They were actually taking a cosmology that belonged to no tribe and introducing it to all the tribes. They found that the tribes wanted to belong to this cosmology at some point. It made perfect sense. Um, they would then say, you can have your culture, but not an army. But you can have, you can, you can conscript people into our armies. The Chinese army for the first thousand years was quite a ragtag <laughs> group. People with no clothes and spears, along with people in armor. Um, so uh, that idea of nationalism as part of the history of Taoism is also to uphold this notion of nationalism over tribalism. So this also creates two other Taoist bodies. There's the alchemical personal experience. There's the social body, which they left largely to Confucianism. And then there's the national body, which made uh, one of the divisions of the Chinese uh, government um, was a Taoist division, you might say. Uh, manned by Orthodox priests, which was called the, the Astro-Geomantic Department. So that any activity of the central government needed to be double-checked against astrology and feng shui. Um, that department of the government was second largest number of people next to the army for most of Chinese history. A lot, a lot of records, um, because it wasn't through transmediums, it was through records. Um, 
and they basically had a computer system um, the Manchurians had created. Because by the time the Manchurians took over, the documents of history were in the thousands, tens of thousands of books, recording everything from the emperor's Baal movements to invasions to floods, etc., all written down. Um, so if one of the Qing emperors needed to make a decision, it was all done by ritual, meaning that an ambassador would come from, or a magistrate would come from an area that was threatened by the Mongols or something, saying that we might have an invasion. So we'd have to come to the capital and tell the emperor in poetry, actually, in a very particular kind of language. And then the emperor would say, we will decide. <laughs> and then out the back, <laughs> magistrates would run to these other buildings um, to find a precedent for crossing that border at this time of year. Mm. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a computer. Uh, you know, two guys would run out to the two buildings. They'd talk to the guy at the door who would know which hallway to go to. They'd run down the hallway. And along these hallways, someone would have memorized three or four hundred books each. And they'd say, they'd give the exact location of the threat. And all these people would be informed by the almanac what day it was and literally to the hour they heard, and they would know the precedent. But 1,122 years ago, we had the same request. <laughs> um, we waited till Wednesday, and we lost. So <laughs> that would go. And so there'd be bits transferred back to the Chinshur. These were 12 great scholars who advised the emperor directly, like a cabinet. One of them would do the poetical summary. And they would be up all night, probably. The emperor would take a nap. And then in the morning, they would uh, teach the emperor the poem of the response to the magistrate and the generals, which was basically yes or no. But it was uh, very poetical. And the language that was used is all lost. You know, nobody speaks that way, though Master Hua did. <laughs> um, there is an old, very formal Manchurian way to speak at court, and uh, very few people now understand it. But the idea of it being a ceremony means that you would need to use language appropriate to the time and place in order to transmit the answer. So it isn't, you know, modern English. It's definitely uh, subtle, because all of that had to do with moving the chi all that had to do with the way rhythms were going, when that ambassador or magistrate could depart, the capital was calculated. Everything was calculated so that the rhythm was advantageous. Um, very complicated. But uh, it took 2,000 years to develop, and people were well trained. So it actually did work. And this is parallel to the social body, which is the people who actually ran the government trying to um, use the Confucian principles of justice and fairness and uh, fair distribution of resources, etc. Those people ran the social body. And then locally, in the local temples, Taoists would help regulate the resources of the local people. So, for instance, when I was training as a priest in Taiwan, the very common kinds of requests that would come in would be you know, two miscarriages in a week in a parish, or um, for people with migraines. And the priests would all go in the back room and choose a day, auspicious day, for a type of ritual. Um, and then come out and say yes. Um, usually there'd be a bill for the offerings, <laughs> like what kinds of offerings need to be made, and et cetera. But this is not a public ritual. It's not church. These people would do their rituals behind closed doors, usually in the rat hour, which is the transition hour of midnight to one. Um, and then the results would create a festival. That if, uh, you know, for pregnancies, went to full term uh, afterwards, those babies would be considered an outcome of the ritual. So, 
it's just and this is common sense in China. It's not uh, mysterious. It'd be common sense. Common sense before there was Taoism as well, because before it would have been shaman doing this. The difference between a shaman and a Taoist usually is uh, one has no training and the other has a lot of training. Shaman usually are what we say in the West, called. Yeah. They're either crazy or very sick or something, and so they have to resort to going to some shaman who then teaches them how to, in some sense, die, but survive. Yeah. And then they owe. So usually, everyone I've talked to anyway, they, they owe healing and fortune telling. They, they own they owe the community some kind of payback. They may stay a little bit crazy there. No one ever wants to marry them or anything. <laughs> but uh, but the, that's the shamanic way. And probably those shaman families that developed in the three or four millennia before the common era, those families were the ones that developed Taoism. Most of the shaman were women. So eventually we think the first Taoists were making records of their daughters' trances and saw a system in it. Because in the Taoist tradition, we, we make it a distinction between meditation and trance, um, but are expert in both. The idea is you can't really be expert in one without being expert in the other. Because if you think meditation is trance, then there's no real fruition. If you think trance is meditation, then there's no meditation fruition. So you know something. You may have a predilection for one or the other, but you would know the parameter of your trance by having experience of meditation. You would know the parameter of meditation by knowing when you're in a trance. And you'd be very explicitly trained. Uh, and some, uh, in most cases, locally trained as well. For what might be local to cause you to go into trance. And this is, uh, trance is not uh, possession. Trance is, you can volunteer for possession, but you would know exactly how to do that, and also you'd have an off button. Most shaman don't have the off button. That's enough now. <laughs> anyway, so we should uh, leave some time for questions, maybe, wherever we've gone with all of this. So, the floor is open to <laughs> questions, responses, queries. And if you can speak loud, and then I'll, I'll repeat it for the, the question. Uh, I'll speak loud. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you imagine the new teachings that can actually transform ghosts into humans? What, what would they look like? What do you imagine they would look like? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really know. Maybe a pop culture? <laughs> I think it's a good start. You know, K-pop. Are you familiar with K-pop? Korean <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to repeat the question, what would be a modern way in which um, ghosts might be transformed into human beings? Yeah. K-pop. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think just just uh, starting. So I don't think we know right now, but I think that you know it might be a start. Uh, you know, Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh. With Martin Luther King, all those people, but it's too old school. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Making new heroes, making new kings, you know, that's not, it's not going to come that way, I don't think. It's too pervasive. Because the only way that they can become our new leaders is as ghost kings. And that's, in a sense, what they are. They're ghost kings. They don't really have anything to say, but we have a nice feeling about them. Yeah. It's not good enough, not strong enough. 
what is it about K-pop or pop culture that you think well, is not going that way my, and it might yeah. actually transform? Well, it's just, you know, I have friends in Bhutan and they know every name of every K-pop star and they, they distinguish each other according to which one they look like. It's very pervasive. In other words, it's, it's snuck around to all the venues of old culture. Mm -hmm. So is it the dissemination aspect? Yeah. yeah the, and the easy access? Easy access, uh -huh. yeah. And it doesn't, it's not very demanding. Yet they know every single name. They know where they are next Tuesday because of their iPhones. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're coming out as human beings, one by one. Meaning what in this context? Well, they just they say what their feelings are. And, uh -huh. Um, there are, because I think that there's so many ghosts now. The populist is the you know the 20th century populist philosophy has failed. You know, communism has failed. Democracy has failed. All of these things have failed. But we but we can't turn back away from populist. I don't think so. Somewhere we're going. Populist has to become more universal. Um, and I think it's a stage. I don't think it's a success. But I think it's a stage way beyond uh, English-speaking pop, because the Korean pop has an emotional quality that relates much more to India and China, so a much bigger audience. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson doesn't do it. Yeah. But he's a, like, you know, he's a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> Walking backwards, uh, just perfect, <laughs> like a ghost. <laughs> yeah, Sunki. So I may, I may connect my question to uh, your answer. Uh, K-pop is a really, really big thing in Korea, and mm. every young kids there. We never, in my in my school years, we never expect. Oh, I want to be a singer. Mm. We never can. You know, we never listen to yeah. that kind of this. Oh, I, I want to be this one. Never on that list, a singer and entertainer. But now it's very prevalent even in Korea, mm. and um, I kind of have the similar feeling. For me. Um, I think that the, the, the kind of sexuality many Koreans mm. have is mm. very, my, in my words, is very, oh, I'm living my country, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of very oriented, um, younger flesh, mm -hmm. I mean, younger mm -hmm. flesh, and I, I like the K-pop a lot, but uh, watch, keep watching them, I kind of feel the big generation gap in Korea, mm -hmm. and the kind of the cultural uh, dividing between mm -hmm. old people and young people. Mm -hmm. And this K-pop very prevalent, very very powerful culture in Korea. And this K-pop somehow seem to represent that that obsession with the younger flesh one, mm -hmm. like related to sexuality. So yeah. I kind of started to feel um, critical about that. And yeah, I would say these two generations are two types of ghosts. Two types of ghosts. Yeah, one is nostalgic, you know. Nostalgic. Wants it to go back to normal, which they aren't normal. And, <laughs> and the younger people are like really loose ghosts, floating ghosts, you know? not really identifying with, very much with history. And this is another kind of ghost, but I think it's a, because of the openness, just loose associations. You know? And you also said the emotional, so when, yeah. I, when I watch many, especially horror, like horror, horror, horror movies, <laughs> when I watch a Korean horror movie, the thing really distinguish, distinguishing to my eyes is, wow, our horror movie is really emotional. Mm -hmm. And some horror movies in the States and Japan, mm -hmm. it's quite different. So mm -hmm. I, I really like, you know, you said that's an emotional thing. So yeah. I absolutely agree with that. And my, the, my next personal question is, when I came, I came to the uh, States like nine years ago, and when I uh, landed in this land, which was North, um, East of Bay, the North um, New York State, mm. I felt, I might be wrong, like, I felt, oh, this country has much, the ghost <laughs> has much less a ghost, I mean, less crowded, mm. less crowded. Mm -hmm. But I have, I'm not a, I have some friends who really feel and see ghosts or something, but mm. I, I was not, never that kind of person. But when I landed in this land, wow, this land is much uh, less, the ghosts are much less here. In Korea, I, I somehow, I feel packed. Something is packed, but mm. when I came here, always much scant, mm. and I'm scant in yeah. a way, like spiritually. And you, so I wonder, um, you studied in, you you spe you're spending many time, many years in Asian countries mm. and, and in, in this country. So some sort of a comparative uh, feeling between ghost world and yeah. There. Well, in in Taoism, we say that uh, you know everybody uh, can see the ghosts. 
that have the same smell of blood. So it means that in Korea you can have more sensitivity to Korean ghosts than to New York ghosts. As the number of Koreans grow in New York, maybe, <laughs> but it's uh, the smell of the blood, that, that, that's the term. This is not a modern Chinese term at all, but, but it is a Taoist idea. So, you know, like, um, when I was in Taiwan, and everybody thought I was very clever, that I could learn all these things, they kept saying, oh, you're more Chinese than we are, all of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, <laughs> their vision of the world, they said, if you return to your country, you'll need to have a job. So they said you should be trained as an exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some strange uncles tell me what I should do for a living, but, but uh, that was very interesting. So, I mean, I agreed, but I've never done that because the idea of exorcism in the West is very different than Taoism. Um, they, they see all people's accomplishments in Taoism as exorcistic. So, for instance, if you can keep calm, for instance, just your calm person, not insensitive person, you know, not dull person, not that kind of calm, but calm person, then you clear the unsettled dead, maybe a, a hundred yards. If you have a really great accomplishment, then they, that was with nine levels of exorcism. If you have a ninth level, you no longer think about it at all, but a uh, thousand miles around you. Things are turbulent um, for the unsettled. Turbulent doesn't mean everyone's completely resolved, but it, the, your existence is a kind of resolution phenomenon. When you recognize your own deathlessness, for instance, ghosts have a reaction that's even stronger than humans. So, something like that. When you, uh, when I use the word ghost in America, I just, this is why I don't like to talk about it very much. It's kind of like Walt Disney comes to mind or something, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost or, or horror movies or something. But ghosts also produce uh, depression, um, chronic illness. Um, there are loads of them in the tenderloin. In other words, in certain places where certain kinds of activities take place, where people are supposedly benefiting each other, but they're harming each other. And they, they're humans, but actually feeling their humanity, they're selling crack because you really need it. <laughs> this is actually not a human activity. So that also means that uh, the unsettled dead come to this kind of place and encourage it make it impossible for the police to stop it. Yeah. So that's a type of qi, and Chinese is called xia qi, uh, it's like, it means like smoky or unclear qi. And when human beings take care of each other and smile and wave and uh, really have concern for each other, this creates zhen qi, normal qi for humans, then we can get together and do extraordinary things, which is Human beings are not very extraordinary, but when they get together, they can be extraordinary. So when we create some sort of chen qi environment, feng shui-wise, or astrologically, or through practice of something, then we can uh, help the unresolved and actually do great things at the same time. But it's always negotiable. We don't, this uh, Taoist vision of where we are is many, many, many kinds of things sharing the space with us. <laughs> And we're all in a different rhythm, so knowing how to rhythmically act and stop and retreat and go forward, etc., has also to do with this xie qi, not constantly pushing forward as if you're the only one here. Like having endless ambition, but recognizing when to stop and step away, go to the right, <laughs> etc. This is a fundamental Taoist idea. If your body is uh, tuned to this, then your instincts do this. Yeah, well, seven minutes left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I oh, yeah. Um, I, well, 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 first the thought that, that um, having had a little bit of experience with shamanic reality um, in South India, but then also, of course, 
reading all kinds of books. Um, there's always the drums and the rattles. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about rhythm, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean that that seems like it's always mm -hmm. there, particularly mm -hmm. for healing. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like a uni really a universal um, thing. Um, then I was thinking about the American College for Traditional Chinese Medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, what happens when ghosts do acupuncture? <laughs> I mean, uh, what what is it then? Yeah. Uh, because obviously, mm -hmm. the method you were saying that the doctors were kind of dropouts from the mm -hmm. Taoist mm -hmm. kind of academy. Yeah. So, what what is it then that the Chinese medicine of that sort, which is really uh, severed, as far as I can tell, really completely from the things that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, what it, what does it really do? Well, again, all the things I'm talking about are not elite, they're natural phenomena. So some people just without training have mm. spontaneously human qualities and can use the medicine well. Mm. Um, the thing about ghosts is they're weaker than us, generally speaking, so they really have to gang up to create harm. Mm -hmm. you know? Because ghosts are not demons. Mm -hmm. Ghosts are ghosts. So it's only, you know, it's like, I don't really smoke anymore, just one a day. You know, yeah. That's a ghost. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a demon is hiding cartons of cigarettes in the garage and uh -huh. smoking a whole pack while everybody's out of the house. That's demonic possession. Ghost possession is just going out the back with one <laughs> and telling your son, you know, I got just the one. Uh, that's a ghost speaking. So that kind of weakness is not too dangerous. It means that uh, also they're the practitioner of medicine, that they're, uh, they're inhibited in understanding diagnosis of a human. Mm. Yeah. So their diagnosis will be very accurate. Mm. Mm. Um, or if you're but we have to, other ghosts. So. Yeah, and in that case, <laughs> and in that case, it's kind of uh, yeah. Most of medicine is that way. Now, not just uh, Chinese medicine, but also um, you know di just. Going to a surgeon for a medical examination is inevitable. They're going to say you need surgery. This is <laughs> this is a ghost surgeon. <laughs> I'm buying a new car. You'll definitely need surgery. You know they. they, <laughs> they yeah, yeah, there are these other factors which are not human factors. Human beings don't do that actually, but uh, uh, it's still possible out there. It's a confusing situation. Most important though, it's not really checking the world. About checking yourself. That's mm. the bottom line is, you know, just check your own humanity. This is where Confucianism becomes absolutely essential for understanding Taoism. Mm. Because if we aren't reflecting on our own condition, just as it is, just no matter what your thinking is, reflect on what it is and the reactions. What are your emotions? Are you doing when Patsama does something very, very kind to you? How do you feel? This should be the basic human motivation to be kind. Mm. Not something else, not advice from saints. It should be just from your own experience. If we have that kind of Confucian training, then we can understand why Taoists were such specialists and sort of a weird subjects we're talking about. Um, and why ordinary Chinese peoples, whose fundamental understanding of the world is Confucian and social, why they would feel it's time to go to the priest because you, they would, don't find argument to actually be very human. Mm. Yeah. But the argument should be short and to the point and to cause agreement. Mm. But if argument goes on and on and on, then it's down to the temple. <laughs> <laughs> because human beings uh, usually use argument just to warm up conversation to agreement. Mm -hmm. But ghosts or demons then will take argument to war will possess for blood sacrifice, etc. So um, it's a simple, it's so incredibly simple, this idea. But, um, and I, I think I'm the only person I know publicly is saying that this Confucian education is really, really fundamental. It's one of the reasons we're misunderstanding Taoism in the West, is we think those traditions are somehow, don't match, or they've been in an argument or something. Mm -hmm. 
not really. Mm. Neo-Confucianism, which is the Confucianism that we know now in the modern times, um, tried to eliminate Buddhism and Taoism by its magnanimous inclusion, but uh, maybe it didn't succeed completely. But it's friendly, I think. It's friendly. <laughs> Minutes. You mentioned that as you got the transmission, the, the group family transmission, mm. you felt the terrifying situation. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say more about that experience and what it was that you needed to uh, re engage with to be able to relate to people. Very, very difficult to say. I, I, um, yeah, you mentioned my disorientation from the transmission of family teachings. Um, yeah, disorientation. I guess what I'd always thought, where I thought my spiritual appetite would always be a hat. You know, I always thought it would be something I would add to my experience, um, not something that would uh, uh, rob me of my experience. Mm -hmm. So the disorientation had a lot to do with the sense of um, that I was frightened by how much time and energy I had spent um, constructing something of no value. And uh, the implications, then, of all the relationships I'd ever had with anyone. And, yeah, this, pre, this is the shamanic blues. Um, the feeling lost completely. And this is after 16 years of Buddhism, so I mean, they hadn't gotten to me. <laughs> I had, you know, they'd had some. I had made all my Buddhist teachers like me and uh, make them think I was important and had understood things, etc. So I thought that was just, you know, it was just like high school. I was smart in high school. I thought it was just, you know, like more smart. Um, but this uh, transmission, which was so abstract, you know, just standing up through these long rituals. Um, didn't allow me to uh, do sort of a cognitive reevaluation step by step. It was overwhelming. So um, I was, you know, I was semi functional. Big surprise. There was another surprise, which I think is a little bit more fun to talk about, um, is how little I needed to be sensible uh, to the people around me. I mean, how, <laughs> how strictly I had maintained relationships in such a way that I thought was required. But particularly returning to the United States, um, I was not answering people's questions. I was confused by the simplest ideas, and nobody noticed. That was also very interesting to me. <laughs> and nobody cared. Um, that was very interesting. So I went into a solitary retreat for a year, and that was very, it was very, very good um, because I was able to sort of relax. Um, by not trying to bring some abstract experience into ordinary equations. Um, and the way the retreat ended was very simple and among friends, so it was fairly smooth. I have many friends who have done long retreats. Uh, several have killed themselves, um, gone completely nuts. Um, hate their teachers now, all kinds of things. Because uh, I think going in and coming out has to be done very, very carefully. That's why the traditions were so strict. In other words, what is the meaning of transmission? The meaning of transmission, as my teacher explained it to me, was that since I was around 115 generations of the family, I would have to be able to manage 115 memories. I was being given the memories of 115 people. And that was considered to be the reasonable way to explain it to me. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is in two languages as well, so, yeah. 115 memories. I could probably do that. I've been <laughs> memorized a lot of stuff when I was in school. Uh, but uh, it was something like that, and it's sort of coming to... I mean, even when I do public speaking like this, I'm um, not always sure exactly which memory I'm coming from. 
and how to edit what I'm saying so it doesn't sound too weird. <laughs> but I think I've gotten better and better at it. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, someone who hasn't spoken yet, if they want, we're pretending it's democracy, which has failed, of course. <laughs> well, Dr. Wu, any? Okay. No? <laughs> Melanie? Well, I just, when you said that Confucianism and Taoism have something to contribute, I mean, I don't hear that at all, except from Lao well, sure mm -hmm. that the, the, the traditions are two sides of the same coin, and they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not really against each other, and especially in terms of Confucianism, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, what you said at the beginning, it's hierarchical, and mm -hmm. stiff, and rigid, and mm -hmm. all the, the misunderstandings. So could you speak more about how Confucianism can um, contribute to proper understanding of Taoism. Are you familiar with Tu Huiming? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think he is you know, a very good modern spokesperson for what's mm -hmm. really valuable about the tradition, not mm -hmm. just restructuring history, mm -hmm. but actually rethinking um, human resources, the distribution of human resources on Earth right now. Mm -hmm. But Confucianism has a great contribution to make. In that process, and the, the people who will make the contributions can use this self-reflection process um, to become leaders, and I think that's very meaningful. I do too. Um, <laughs> um, self-reflection uh, being, you know, like people who are snobby, like a Buddhist, uh, is very snobby about meditation practice, or, um, and think that Confucian self-reflection, for instance, is like Cub Scouts. And uh, you know, siddhas are marines, <laughs> some kind of. You know, maybe. But uh, there is no siddhas without self-reflection. Mm -hmm. We don't have the stories of siddhas when they were eight or nine years old. But at some point, <laughs> not Confucianism, but uh, just humanity. If you don't understand your humanity, you cannot build a marine. You have to understand, this is, you know, maybe like compassion idea in Buddhism, but some kind of basic idea of our humanity and its limitations is what makes great leaders. And this is the, this is the heart, I'm not saying the history of Confucianism is particularly valuable, but the heart of the teachings, very much great value. And the fact that South Korea and Japan and Taiwan, etc., have made an effort to keep Confucianism legitimate, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and what China needs now yeah. <laughs> yeah. is the transmission back. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it will get it. I'm very optimistic that it will get that transmission from those countries. And the problems with Mongolia and Tibet, etc., is that they have no Confucian ground. That's the only problem between China and Tibet. What do you mean by that? <laughs> They're thinking this is a country of marines. You know that uh, the Tibetans think <laughs> that uh, you can enslave a third of the population to create eight siddhas. And you can. And maybe it's all right, ultimately. But, uh, but those slaves will eventually act up. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something about this ordinary life Confucianism, uh, it will make communism and socialism, I think, a little less Christian. Mm -hmm. Socialism is probably Christianity at its best. Uh, Joseph Needham told me that. <laughs> um, and uh, communism and now socialism in China is the only dysfunctional part, is they're not Christians. They're really Confucianists. So the waking up this sort of Confucian heart, I think, will make it Chinese socialism be really Chinese. Yeah. And it's, I think, inevitable. And we should all be watching South and North Korea, because I think that's, that's the uh, lab test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I have read a lot of stories in Taoism. Mm. I mean, it's quite uh, romantic. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, like we don't mean we know a lot yeah. about the Taoist priests and yeah. they have some kind of romantic stories. Yeah. So uh, then, in your perspective, mm. uh, how do you think about uh, the relation of men and women in Taoism? Um, well, you mentioned Liu Dongbing. Um, uh, this is in two hours. I can't explain the entire history of Taoism, but uh, there was a reform movement uh, that took place about a thousand years ago um, that created this uh, new Taoism. Yeah, Lu Dongbing is a kind of uh, superhero of that new Taoism, um, and it adopted a great deal of Buddhism. So oddly enough, that's when monastic Taoism starts. But the Orthodox tradition, uh, you're not really a priest unless you're married. Um, it's a requirement. And the, the priest families were always in marrying by arrangement so that family traditions got integrated through marriage, etc. So marriage was very significant. And uh, for going on retreat, husband and wife took turns. For being head priest, husband and wife took turns. This is traditional in Orthodox Taoism. But uh, since the Mongol times, since the 12th century or so, Taoism has, uh, its appearance in the world has become more and more Buddhist, um, monastic, and uh, at the same time that Confucianism is uh, severely traumatized by Mongol invasion and then again by Manchu dominance. Um, because it's not really their hardest in it. Mongols might have used Confucianism, and Manchus used it, but it wasn't from their heart. It's a Han tradition, not a Central Asian tradition. So, um, so men and women always practice as equals, but I don't. Uh, in order to understand that, we have to understand that it was from the beginning. So there was no feminist uprising. <laughs> in Orthodox Taoism, because it was from the very beginning. Chang Gaoling's original 25 disciples were all married, um, and he had three wives. And at the end of his life, he and the three wives all uh, turned to light at the same time, all equal practitioners. So is there, a, like, a, how is the status of female priest, like female priest? Now? Uh, now it's all mixed up with Confucianism and Buddhism and, and communism and feminism. And so uh, I don't know what the standing is now. But Orthodox is out. The communists don't like Orthodox Taoism. They like Reform Taoism. And in Reform Taoism, uh, practitioners, women are nuns and men are monks. Mm. Uh -huh. So it's like, I mean, it's uh, combined with Buddhism. Yes. Yeah. And that's acceptable to the communists. So that's the only ordinations being given, etc. So only within the last few years, um, privately, Orthodox ordinations have been happening in provinces where the provincial government has stood against the central government. And they've won in Fujian, they've won in Jiangxi province, and they've won in Shanxi province. But they'll go probably province by province. Sichuan's next. That's, these were the strongholds of Orthodox Taoism, Sichuan and the southeast of China. So they've already uh, organized it. Um, but the rest of China is mostly Buddhist mixed with this Reform Taoism. And of course, Reform Taoists uh, very often are shaman, so it's a real confusing uh, hodgepodge. <laughs> My, I've been to China maybe uh, 12 times as a guest of Taoist Association and also a guest of many temples, and I have nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I mean, there are there's a couple of family traditions that I know of are coming back, but it's all very discreet. Mm. The central government doesn't really care to suppress religion anymore unless it has a political motive. So um, they're pushing Buddhism and Taoism to be political, meaning get tourist dollars. But that's the only politics they're concerned with at this point. And the, the organizations 
the Taoist Association of China. <laughs> it's an oxymoron if they ever heard one. <laughs> the Taoist Association. Um, yeah, it's mostly politics. Yeah. And religion is mostly politics. So. I just experienced them. Mm. Uh, I don't know Jim Ryan before, maybe 20 years ago, mm. in Brooklyn they have uh, all religion together. Have yeah. a, so you, you, you introduced me to speech. Oh, interesting. Uh, idea. <laughs> yeah. No. So first three years, uh, uh, my topic is uh, Lao Tzu Taoist. Taoist, not Taoist. Mm. Taoist. Mm. Then the fourth year, uh, Confucius, they want added Confucius. Mm. But uh, they invited a, a person coming from China. But uh, this person, they uh, originally they, 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 they promised to come. But uh, just a few days ago, they, he didn't want to come. So they invited me to <laughs> give a lecture about Confucius. So lots of people surprised. Before you are you are you are Taoist. Now you become a Confucius. <laughs> <laughs> they really surprised. Okay, yeah. Con Confucius, Taoist, little difference. Mm. There's a generous people thinking this way, mm. especially in here. Mm. So you talk about the Confucius, the Taoists can 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 understand each other. You, you, my feeling, if Taoism is still limited by the religion called Taoist religion, Confucius still, so Confucius, but the Confucius is most the new Confucian. Mm. Actually, new Confucius is a little bit become a religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. So if uh, Buddhism said, yeah. if it's a religion, in my opinion, mm. difficult to understand. They limit by their <laughs> idea, they can uh, break through. Mm -hmm. So I think Taoism will be good to Taoist thought, Taoist philosophy. Uh, Confucius uh, going to confuse philosophy, maybe we can and understand each other. Mm -hmm. Not uh, limited by religion. Mm -hmm. If we talk religion, impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is my just my experience yeah. feeling. Yeah. And it's the same of politics. Religion and politics in this case is identical. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect note on which to um, <laughs> conclude. And um, um, as um, the video of this is, um, we'll check how its quality is. And then, depending on our guest, if it's OK to make it available sure. to people, then We'll make it available, maybe put it on ACS website. And um, um, wow, that's my response. <laughs> um, um, and um, I, I would like to, uh, it's an old Buddhist tradition, you know? Yeah. As, 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 you know, before they catch their airplane and escape from the land of ghosts, um, <laughs> to, to invite you back at some point. Okay. Um, on topics that would be of interest to people. For some of you, this is like a, I don't know, an introduction to, um, yes, a very non-normal presentation of things of the heart. And um, so, if you had a good experience, uh, that's very California. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or even if you didn't, but something is like, you know, you maybe not be thinking about ghosts in the same way over the weekend. <laughs> so, thank you all very much, and I want to thank right. our guests for coming. Yes, thank you very much. All right.